This is One on One. Kevin Cook is the author of a fascinating book, um, Kitty Genovese, The Murder, The Bystanders, The Crime That Changed America. Good to have you with us, Kevin. Good to be here. 1964, Kitty Genovese is killed. A little past the 50th anniversary, if you will. Uh, the show will air well after that as well. Um, Kitty Genovese was who? Oh, she was a, a bartender uh, in Queens, a, a likable, popular, energetic, hardworking young woman, uh, came from Brooklyn. Uh, her family uh, joined a lot of uh, families from Brooklyn and uh, the boroughs that, that, that went away, went to the suburbs mm. in the early 60s. She graduated from high school and loved the city and wanted to stay. Uh, she lived in, as you say, 1964, a fascinating time, a transitional time when the uh, city was changing so quickly. And, Kew and, Gardens? And, yes, Kew Gardens, right. which was a very safe sure. place to live. People left their uh, doors open. At night, Girl Scouts are coming around selling cookies. Uh, people are answering each other's phones when it rings just to help out. It was a out. neighborhood. It was, it was a, a very friendly neighborhood, a working class. She home from work one night, what happened? She was. Uh, she was attacked out of nowhere. Uh, to me, the primordial fear that people have. Uh, you're alone in the dark, and something springs out of the darkness. It was a monster. There are monsters out there, I think. And uh, it was a man who was looking at random for a young woman to kill. Uh, and uh, he stabbed her twice. Of course, it becomes famous in an interesting way. This becomes famous as the story in which all of her neighbors, 38 precisely neighbors, watched out their windows. Was as it a courtyard? Kitty was slain. It was not a courtyard. It was a street, Austin Street in Kew Gardens, storefronts. Uh, there's an apartment building across the street. There are apartment windows yeah. on both sides. Could they the see it happening? They, some people could. She screamed. She screamed loudly enough to wake people. It's three in the morning. People are groggily getting out of bed, trying to get to the window to see what's happening. It's a dark night. They're looking out. We don't even have the uh, contemporary uh, street lights that sure. we have today. Those grew, as many other things did, out of the outcry over this case. Uh, people were confused. There were some people who knew what was going on. Uh, there were others who didn't. And in a year and a half of working on this case, I found that it was a lot more complicated and a more fascinating study and a more fascinating person uh, than anybody, I think, had known about Kitty. But for those who did, in fact, see something and knew something horrible mm -hmm. was happening, did any of them pick up the phone and call the police? They did not. It was harder to... Well, in fact, one did. The police didn't record that call. Uh, my investigation found uh, uh, a young man who was 14 at the time who swears that his father called the police, and they did not send a car at that time. There were reasons not to send a car. I mean, one way you call the police in those days, there is no 911. 911 came out of the outcry from this case. Uh, you call, you get the precinct, you're often invited to mind your own business. The police have a lot to do. People hear things in, in the middle of the night. People get in fights and yell in the middle of the night. There's a bar that stays open until 3 a.m. on this very block. They were used to loud noises. So there was a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, there were people, more than 38 people probably, who heard Kitty's screams. She was murdered over a 30-minute period. Over a 30-minute period. And the way the story has come down over these 50 years and been understood by most people, and is still taught in college classes, that those people, the neighbors, witnessed this whole 30 minutes. And it's not so. It didn't happen that way. She bravely got up after a man, after Kitty was initially stabbed, a man across the street lifts his window. He's a concerned neighbor and yells, leave that girl alone. The killer, a man named Winston Mosley, then runs off to wait to see what will happen. Now, windows are popping on on Is both sides Mosley? of the street. There's Winston Mosley, yes, after he was captured. Doesn't Mosley come back? He escaped from Attica five years no, later. No, no, no. Doesn't Mosley come back to... Uh, yes, Kill exactly. Kitty? That's right. Uh, he came, comes back after waiting to see if there are sirens, after right. waiting to see if people Nothing pour happens. out of the buildings. He waits. Nothing happens. And in the meantime, Kitty has, has bravely stood. Had she stayed where she was, all these people could have seen her out of their windows. Instead, she tried to get home. And home was around the corner, into the darkness, the entrance in the back of her apartment building, by the railroad tracks, uh, the Long Island railroad tracks are right behind this building. That's where she tried to get. She couldn't get there. She was been stabbed. She was very weak. She fell into another entranceway, 
where for a moment she found solace and safety, she thought. She couldn't climb the stairs. She collapsed at the, at the bottom of the uh, stairs. And that, those stairs, and that is when Winston Mosley came back. He tried a couple of doors. They were locked. He tried that door and found Kitty lying at the bottom of the stairs. And then, as he later told police, he finished what he had done. She was not fatally injured until that second attack by Mosley. And there was one man at the top of the stairs who did open his door and saw what was happening. He knew who Kitty was. He was the witness. We do know how many witnesses there were, eyewitnesses to the final, the fatal stabbing of Kitty Genovese. There was one. And I grew up as a kid hearing about Kitty Genovese, even though I was in New Jersey and my father used to talk about her all the time. You know, it was like, I used to think sometimes because she was Italian-American, but, but it was there a million reasons. She was a working-class person, and we were working-class people. Right. Queens was very much like the neighborhood we grew up in. Mm -hmm. but then he used to tell me the story, his version, right? because people didn't know, that you never let people, if someone's attacking someone, we had a responsibility to step in. You could not be a bystander. That was his interpretation of it, because his interpretation was based on media reports. True. Some of them wrong, mm -hmm. some of them incomplete, whatever. What do you take away from all this? Well, I believe that a lot of positive uh, uh, social change came about, including the 911 system, including the belief that we should intervene when we can. Um, uh, victims' rights grew out of this. Uh, and it was really a misunderstanding of what happened that night. Uh, and in some ways, Kitty has been treated as an urban martyr. And I don't think she has to symbolize something to be important for her well, life to matter. What do you want her to life matter. to mean and her death to mean? I want, I want her life to be as singular as any of our lives. I, I thought that uh, she's been known only as a victim. And, and she was an admirable, energetic, likable young woman mm. who deserved to have her life story told as well as the death. I do think that all the discussion of this case and the way it's been reported and understood for 50 years has encouraged people to get involved. I mean, one of the most remarkable reactions was by Chesley Sullenberger, mm. who uh, remembered, he was in Captain. Texas. Captain Chesley, Captain, Captain Sully, Sully uh, who was in Texas in middle school That's reading right. about Kitty Genovese. And he vowed at the time, if I ever had a chance to save some people's <laughs> lives, I'm going to do what I can. Yeah. And, and he, but he, like many people, saw New On York. On the Hudson River, he stepped he up. Did. He had seen New York as a cold, unfeeling place. He lands his plane and saves his passengers' lives on the Hudson. He's then out on the, on the wing of the plane with his passengers, and he sees New Yorkers coming out on boats to try to do what they can to help. And he felt something must have changed in that cold, hard city. Uh, I, think, I think the case, as it's understood, came to supposedly explain mm. awful things about city life. Um, some of those are true, and some of them turned out not to be true. You know, uh, some of it, the media reports, not right, some incomplete, some as numbers, but you've done an important work here. Uh, Kevin Cook, Kitty Genovese, the murderer, the bystanders, the crime that changed America. Um, it's all right here, and I want to thank you for documenting that, for doing the research, and for helping us to understand why Kitty Genovese's death, but more importantly, her life mattered so much. We appreciate you uh, doing this important work. Thanks Thank so much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center, Berkeley College, Qualcare Inc., NJM, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.